Hello everyone. Flying is never-ending learning and in a recent review of aerodynamics and aircraft performance I ran across a diagram which looks pretty simple but there's a lot of interesting information in it uh, and it lends itself to a lot of good discussion. It's the VG diagram and somebody who knows a lot about it and has given a presentation uh, on several occasions about it is here with me, Doug Rosendahl from Mason City. Thanks for Martin. It's great to see you here. And you. So um, you referenced a presentation that I've made over the years called the wing removal lever and how not to use it. That's right. And typically I give that uh, presentation to um, RV home builders, experimental aircraft owners, things like that, because they tend to go out and uh, do aerobatics in these airplanes. And I find that they don't really understand uh, what is, you know, the VG diagram, what is commonly called the envelope. And uh, most of the time we spend most of our life squarely in the middle of the envelope. Uh -huh. But as you expand your flight horizons and venture into aerobatics or you find yourself in turbulence, it's possible to, uh, you know, fly into the corners of the envelope a little bit. And if you're going to do that, and it may be uh, an inadvertent encounter because of wake turbulence or rate, uh, clear air turbulence. And so if you understand uh, all the corners of the envelope, I think it really helps uh, make you a, a better, a more well-rounded pilot. And so that's what I thought we would, uh, we'd kind of uh, revisit that presentation and talk about it today. That sounds great. All right. So the VG diagram generally, and people will often recognize it when they see it, is, uh, looks like this. On the uh, y-axis, we have load factor. And on the x-axis, we have uh, airspeed. So if we put airspeed down here, and we have load factor here, and we're going to take a standard category airplane, and uh, and, and it, our airplane's going to be a perfectly designed imaginary airplane. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so this perfectly designed imaginary airplane has a 1G stall speed of uh, 50, 50 knots, we'll say. We'll, we'll do this in knots. Okay. And uh, Okay, so this is a rough approximation of the VG diagram. And uh, while it looks uh, a little bit intimidating, it's really pretty simple. So we start at 0G, and we all know that uh, the airplane's not flying at zero G, okay? Mm -hmm. It's floating, it's ballistic. Right. If the airplane is ballistic, we can throw a rock. Just throw a rock. And it's not generating any lift, but it's flying. So, the, you know, so on a ballistic arc with zero G, because the airplane, the, uh, the rock in flight is experiencing zero G, it has no stall speed. So the stall speed at zero G of our airplane uh, is zero. Mm -hmm. And to evidence that, you could do a hammerhead stall, and you could pull the airplane up, and at zero G, it's just hanging there. It's not flying. The air's not moving over the wing, but the airplane's not stalled either because there is no air movement. Right. Um, that's our, our rock that we've thrown. But in our perfectly designed airplane at one G, it's going to stall at 50 miles an hour, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so that's the 1G stall speed, and that's the speed that we find published in the POH, right? Correct. And, but I would argue we should, we're doing our private pilots a disservice when we teach them that the airplane stalls at a speed. It only stalls at that speed under very certain conditions. That's right. And so that's the only time we're going to find it there. But we need to teach our students to be aware that the airplane can stall at any airspeed at any attitude. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people can recite that, and they have uh, a rote level knowledge of that statement, but they don't have a clear understanding of what that means. Mm -hmm. So this Mustang here sitting behind us, it stalls at give or take 100 miles an hour, all right? And so I can hit the bottom of a loop 
at 200 miles an hour and pull back on the stick and stall the airplane at 4 G's. Uh -huh. I can ease off, I can be vertical, and it'll stall somewhere around uh, probably 125, 150 because I have positive load factor on the airplane even though. And I can go over the top of the loop at 75 miles an hour and the airplane will be flying because I'm at a quarter of a G load factor. Uh -huh. Conversely, on the down line, I can be at 175, 180 mile an hour and just pull back on the stick and the airplane will nibble, it's starting to stall and then stall it again at, at or above 200 miles an hour. So as we go faster, we know the wing can lift more, right? Right. You remember the, the, fa the formula for that? The lift increases with the square of speed. Yeah, the now, speed. so that's really something. When we say that, astute pi pilots' eyes glaze over. But let's think out of it in an entirely much simpler way. Mm -hmm. If we double the airspeed, the airplane will lift four times as much. If we double the airspeed, the wings can lift four times as much. That's as right. Well. That's a really simple way to mm -hmm. remember it. So take the, the airspeed times two, and two times two equals four to the load factor. It's that simple. If we triple the airspeed, the airplane will lift nine times as much. Mm -hmm. Because if we triple the airspeed, three times three is nine, and so that's our load factor. Okay, so that's how this, that's what defines this logarithmic curve here, is the fact that load factor increases by the square of airspeed. Yeah. All right? So our perfectly designed normal category or utility category airplane has a plus four mini 3.8, but we're going to call this airplane plus four because it makes the math easier, mm -hmm. and I'm not so good at math. Um, so if we double the airspeed from 50 to 100, let's move 100 over here, what do we think that makes, so we've doubled it, what's that make our load factor when the airplane stalls? Well, like we said, double the airspeed means four times the load factor, so we're at 4G then. That's right. So here, at this corner of the envelope, the airplane can pull or has four Gs available. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a pretty easy curve, right? And if we were at two Gs, the square root of two is 1.414. So that'd be 50 times 1.414, and again, public school math, but it's going to be somewhere in the 70, or so. 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. So this line that we've defined here is called the positive aerodynamic limit. All right. And so what I call this line is all that the airplane can give. Right. All right. So if we're flying over here, at 1G at let's say 65 miles an hour and we move this direction and slow down when we ask for more than the airplane can give what's going to happen? We're going to stall. That's correct and this is where most of our flying is done. Maybe we get to a G and a half and maybe we get out to VNO and frankly most people don't get below a half a G very often do they? Mm -hmm. A little turbulence or a pushover so most GA pilots spend their whole life in this little part of the envelope. Really small part of the envelope, but the airplane's capable of flying in a much broader area, right? Mm -hmm. So now that we've decided to de define the positive aerodynamic limit, or what do we call that? What the airplane can give. All the airplane can give. Then we get up to this speed right here, and it has a name and it's at the corner of this envelope. Now, if you're a military pilot, amazingly, they call this the corner speed, okay? Because that's the speed where the airplane, at its positive limit, will turn a min radius turn. Okay. You can turn the shortest corner, and when you're dogfighting, that's important. But in the GA world, we have a different name for this speed. What do you think we call it? Uh, we call that the maneuvering speed. That's right. That is where the airplane is going to stall before we move beyond the positive structural limit. And so that is the name of this line, the positive structural limit. So if we call this line all the airplane can give, what do you think we're going to call this line? 
about all the aircraft can take. That's exactly right. Okay, now if we get another piece of paper here and we extend our line even farther, so if we triple the speed, that'd be 150 mile an hour, so that's going to put us up here somewhere, and that would be it, at 150 miles an hour, this airplane would have 9 G's available. Okay? Now the FAA knows that we can't afford to build, I mean, we, we can't afford the weight of building all airplanes to take 9 G's, so we've established a 4 G limit. But the FAA also knows that sometimes you're going to violate that a little bit, and we don't want the wings to fall off. So the FAA says that whatever the limit is, at 150% of that, the, you have to be able to sustain 150% of the G limit without breaking. Mm -hmm. But if we cross this line and operate in this area, we may not break the airplane, but we could bend it. Okay? And if we go, if we've got a 4G airplane and we go above 6, we could break the wings off the airplane. Now also there are people that would tell you that, well, this applies to max gross weight, right? The entire VG diagram is based on the aircraft being at gross weight. Okay, so if we reduce our gross weight, what's going to happen to the positive aerodynamic limit? Well, that, that line looks different now because my 1G stall speed is reduced from 50 to something slower. Okay, so let's just, let's say it gets reduced from 50 to 40. It moves it this way, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that defines a new line. So if the 1G stall speed is 40, what's the 4G stall speed? 80. 80. Twice. That's correct. Just like, like we had 50 and 100 before, it's now Okay, 40 so that 80. moves our maneuvering speed from 100, 100 to 80. To 80. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some would argue, but there's less weight on the spar because the aircraft weighs less, correct? It's intuitive, right? With less weight, you know, le lower forces, and we should but be able to As a do flight more. instructor and an engineer, I'll bet you know what the problem with that idea is, which is? Well, there are a lot of things on the airplane that still have the same weight. If we reduce the weight, the, the gross weight of the airplane by taking out passenger fuel, then we change the weight of the engine. No. And if we're at four Gs, the engine mount has to support four times the weight of the engine. Mm -hmm. So in a perfectly designed airplane, all the components are designed to the same structural limit. So the structural limit on the engine mount remains, and many other factors in the airplane, maybe the up locks on the gear, landing gear, mm -hmm. maybe the, the horizontal stabilizer, who knows what, they all remain at 4G. So now our new maneuvering speed, if our 1G stall speed has moved to 40, our new maneuvering speed, uh, is reduced to 80 and that's a significant difference yes and the same would be true of our vno it would move down a, a similar by a similar amount so you know the the a lightly loaded airplane in moderate or severe tur turbulence we have to be really careful because the airplane can give easily give more than the airplane can take the wing can easily give more than the airplane can take. Right. So this 4G limit not only applies to the spar, it applies to the engine mount and the tail feathers and a whole host of other things. And mostly what it says is the airplane has been thoroughly tested to that limit. And if we stay below that 4G positive limit, aerodynamic limit, all the airplane can take, we're not going to bend it and we're certainly not going to break it. Uh -huh. Okay. So all the airplane can give, all that it can take. Now, on our airspeed indicator, we have a couple things. Number one, the green arc would start where? At the 1G stall At the speed. 1G, and this airplane doesn't have any flaps anymore. We're not gonna complicate it with that. Okay. So it starts at the 1G stall speed, and where does it go to? To the structural cruising speed. VNO, VNO. right, VNO. structural cruising speed, okay. Now you remember we called this chart the VG diagram, right? Right. We got any idea what the G stands for? Uh, load factor? Nope. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Because that's what we have. We have Gust. V and... Oh, okay. 
That's gust. So the FAA says that the airplane has to be able to sustain a 50 foot per second gust, okay, at, at, and the speed at which it will uh, maintain a 50 foot per second gust is VNO, okay? And a 50 foot per second gust at VNO will result in three more G's or a total of four. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's VNO. Okay. What's amazing is how far is it from one G to four? Four minus one, public three. school math is three. Three G's. How far is it from one, plus one to minus three? Four. No, from plus one to minus two, I'm sorry. Also, plus one to minus is three. That's correct. And so, a 50 foot per second gust, positive or negative, will change our G load by three. Mm -hmm. And that's what determines our VNO. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the gust is what determines the yellow arc, and that's why we don't fly fast in turbulence. And VNE is determined by a lot of things, but one of the limiting factors of VNE is a 25 foot per second gust. And when we put a turbine engine on a Bonanza, if we switch it, turbine airplanes have to have a red line or a VNE at 50 foot per second. So when you convert a piston airplane to a turbine, it lowers your red line, unless you do some extraordinary things, mm -hmm. from, VN, or from the old VNE to the old VNO. And that's why you'll not see a yellow arc on a turbine airplane because they all can sustain a 50 foot per second gust at their red line. And 50 foot per second and 25 foot per second, that sounds pretty abstract. We don't usually measure it that way. How does that relate to, to what we experience as light turbulence, well, moderate uh, turbulence? So 50 foot per second would be a 3,000 foot per minute instantaneous gust. That's a big gust. And the only place we're gonna find that would be in the core of a thunderstorm, a, con a big convective thunderstorm. 25 foot per second, that's a 1,500 foot. Now that's not, that's not as much. Now there are other things that come into V&E. For instance, the airplane's got to demonstrate that it doesn't have flutter at some margin above that. Right. But as we're looking at just load factor, um, that's what determines the V&E is a 25 per, foot per second gust. Okay, so now we're over here on the red line comes down here so and we come to the bottom same true here this is the negative structural limit yes the negative load, structural load limit. limit so that means we're flying along upside down we could push 2 G's negative and if we're below VA the airplane would stall before it uh, would stall in negative regime before it uh, it bent, mm -hmm. okay? And then down here, we have the negative, this limit uh, here. Aerodynamic there limit. There are aerodynamic limit. So I think if you put it in this terms, this is a relatively easy document to understand. Mm -hmm. All the airplane can give, all that it can take. Be careful going fast in turbulence. Chuck Yeager flew out here. There's the only thing limited here is courage, uh -huh. <laughs> you know. Real skill in flying our airplanes is done along the positive, and in the case of aerobatic airplanes, the positive and negative aerodynamic limit. So this is the realm of crop dusters, firefighters. Up here and down here are airshow pilots, uh -huh. and airshow pilots even fly in this regime, right? because they do non-flying gyroscopic maneuvers where they aggressively cross this line uh -huh. and the wing is no longer involved in the equation and the gyroscopics of the propeller and they'll flop around out here for a while and then they'll move back into this realm. And so understanding where your airplane is on this diagram gives you a lot of flexibility to know what you could do to get out of trouble. And understanding that when you encounter wake turbulence or normal turbulence on an approach or something like that, you can really, you really have a lot of room to work if you need to get out of a situation. 
Okay? Okay. So now let's envision a scenario where we're, now that we understand this, uh, this limit, let's envision a scenario where we're flying along uh, in a cloud and the vacuum pump fails and we lose uh, our horizon and we find ourselves in an unusual attitude situation and the airplane is coming straight down. Okay? okay. So we're at very low G, right? Because we're, and we're accelerating and we're at very high airspeed. We're out in this area somewhere here. Uh -huh. Right? Okay? okay? Now we pop out of the clouds with a windshield full of dirt. We're looking at the ground. Okay? It's tempting to pull well, the Well, it is tempting. Back. We need to pull back on the stick, mm -hmm. right? So if we start pulling back on the stick, our load factor is going to go up, right? Yes. Okay, so we found ourselves here, very low G, very high airspeed, and we start loading up the airplane so we don't hit the ground. Okay, when we start loading, putting G on the airplane, what's going to happen to our airspeed? Now we've moved up to this range, maybe. Four Gs is about as much as a, a GA pilot's going to be comfortable pulling. Uh, that's going to feel like a tremendous amount to them. They're probably not going to pull a lot harder than that. But so now we're up here. Once we get up here, and if you put that on very quickly, what's going to happen to our airspeed? Airspeed's going to decrease. That's right. Okay, so we're going fast, and we break out of the ground. We're in an unusual attitude. Our training says if we're going fast or in an unusual attitude, what should we do? The first thing you should do, Speed. reduce power. Reduce power. So we pull our power back and we put G on the airplane. What happens to drag as we increase load factor? It goes up. Way, Way up. up yeah. Okay. Now we're very quickly going to move to here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're over in this regime. Now we're pulling four G's and we're very close to 100 miles an hour. And we're still at some danger of hitting the ground. What do we need to do now? We need to add power back. That's right. Because if we continue to ease off the G and move down, what's happening to our radius of turn? It's going to grow larger. That's right. So we want, in that scenario, we want to load the airplane up, which will reduce our, which will get it turning, and create drag, which will slow us down until we get somewhere very close to the maneuvering speed, a little, little margin in here, mm -hmm. and then we want full power. Because that corner you mentioned for the military We pilots. want to fly the min radius turn we can to avoid hitting the ground. Mm -hmm. And putting power on when you're staring at the ground is counterintuitive. But putting power on, once we get the airspeed under control, will reduce our uh, radius of turn mm -hmm. and increase the likelihood that we miss the ground. And so, you know, the best way to learn how to fly the airplanes outside of this little tiny uh, window that most uh, GA pilots live in is to go get some unusual attitude, some upset training, some basic aerobatic training, and, uh, and fly over there. So what happens if we find ourselves here, we've broken out of the clouds, we're staring at the ground, we're going very fast, and we just instinctively take an adrenaline hit and yank all the way back on the stick. We're going to exceed the structural limit and pull more G's than the aircraft is designed for. That's right. So we may move into this regime and bend the airplane, mm -hmm. or we may move into this regime and break, break the airplane. It. Okay? Now, fortunately, to the uninitiated, if you don't understand straining maneuvers, somewhere in this, the pilot's probably going to go to sleep. <laughs> and when you go to sleep, you're going to ease off. And in fact, here, the stall protects the airplane, okay? Yeah. And up in here, the pilot uh, incapacitation may, in fact, protect the airplane and save the day. But we certainly don't want to count on that. All right? Okay. Down in the bottom here, again, this is negative G maneuvers. Most of us aren't comfortable there. Most of the seatbelt systems that we have in GA airplanes, if we were in a 2G negative uh, situation, your head would be against the ceiling and very, very uncomfortable. But it's always good to know 
that if we're down in this area somewhere, we can unload the airplane and go slower. If we're going slow, unloading the airplane will keep it from stalling. Uh -huh. Because at zero G, the airplane will fly essentially at zero airspeed. It's ballistic, it's just yeah. floating through the so air. Don't need lift. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions about that? No, so far so good. Okay, so now that we understand the basic limits of the, uh, of the envelope, um, it would appear that we can assume that if we're less than four G's, we can't hurt the airplane because the airplane's designed to take four G's. Would you assume from what we've talked about so far that that's a fair statement? The way we've described it so far, absolutely. Yeah, well, yes. that is how we've described it so far. But like every rule, there's an exception. So if we took a cereal box and we put it between two tables, it would support a certain amount of weight, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. And if we put weight on that cereal box, it would, by the nature of its structure, it would support amount of weight because the box has a structure. Sure. Okay, now if we took that cereal box and twisted it by putting a, a block under one corner so that it was no longer square, mm -hmm. do you think it would hold as much or less weight? I think it might hold less weight. It might hold less weight. Well, the same is true of our airplane. Okay, and we call that rolling G. Okay, so if the ailerons are deflected, we're in a turn. We got the ailerons over here and this wing's lifting more, and this wing's lifting less, we're putting a twisting force on that wing, and we're putting more G, we've got a, a, a combined total load factor of four, but we've got more than four on this wing and less than four on that right. wing. And the rule of thumb is, if the ailerons are deflected, we reduce this G, the load factor, the max load factor by a third, uh -huh. okay? So if you're going to pull hard, if you find yourself in a situation where we have to operate along the 4G limit, whether it's turbulence that we encounter uh, and find ourselves pulling to miss the ground or something like that, you want to keep the ailerons neutral because that makes the wing evenly, di evenly distributes the load across the entire wing and it increases the structural integrity of the wing because it's evenly loaded. Uh -huh. All right? So that's just one note to keep in the back of your mind. That's a bigger concern for uh, aerobatic pilots than it is for GA pilots. Because frankly, if it means hitting the ground or going into the bend area, we would rather bend the airplane than hit the ground. Sure. Okay? But even, it, even for GA pilots, when we practice recovery from unusual attitudes, we, we don't do it both at the same time, right? We, we do one well, first we, and then the other. That's the way we teach it, because we teach it in a, in a logical step-by-step -step fashion. Mm -hmm. But yes, um, that's part of the, the driver there, is to not induce rolling Gs on the airplane. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing aggressive aerobatics, you want to think about the stick being more like a gear shift, where when we're aggressively loading the airplane, we aggressively put an aileron and then we aggressively put in G, we don't aggressively put the stick in the corner at high speeds. If you're down in this area where if you aggressively enter that, you're going to move into this regime, that's okay. But if you're aggressively rolling the airplane and pulling G simultaneously and it's going to bring you up into this area, you're reducing the positive structural limit of the airplane because the ailerons are deflected. Uh -huh. And you won't find that in the uh, POH of most G airplanes. That's just, that's something that's known. Yeah. So to wrap this up, here's our VG diagram. We've got load factor on the Y axis, airspeed on the X axis. If we double our airspeed, we get four times the load factor. So this is all the airplane can give up to this speed, the maneuvering speed. That's right. And the military calls it the corner speed. Mm -hmm. And not because it's in the corner of the envelope, but because it's the, the speed which will give you the minimum s radius to turn a corner. Now we come increase airspeed along the positive structural, structural limit. Okay, and what do we call that? It's what the airplane can take. All the airplane can take. And if we cross this line, what happens to the airplane? 
it may bend. That's right. And if we go 50% greater than this line. It may break. That's right. And we get to VNO, which is defined by? By a 50 foot per second gust. That's right. 50 foot per second gust. And when we continue into the yellow arc to the red line, which is limited by? Uh, 25 foot per second gust. Okay. And what's the danger of crossing this line other than the gust? Other design limits like flutter. Aerodynamic pressure, a whole host of things. Mm -hmm. But we know the airplane's been tested to this limit. Mm -hmm. All right. Down to the bottom corner, again, there's a 50 foot per second gust down here. That determines this corner. The VNO, plus three above one, minus three above one. We still have the same protections. Okay. And uh, the negative structural limit and back here to zero. And that is a trip around the yellow envelope. Real flying is done along the positive and negative. These are the people that fly the feel of the airplane. They ride the airplane on the edge, crop dusters, air show pilots, firefighters. All of those folks live and die along this line. And, and it's really that simple. And having an understanding of where we live in this envelope normally and what's available to us if we really need it in a crisis will make us better pilots. And going to your local aerobatic school and actually experiencing what these G factors feel like and what a 4G stall feels like will uh, dramatically expand your personal envelope and I think make you a safer and more capable pilot. And I hope you found this interesting. Uh, thanks for watching and see you soon in another video. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Martin. And shall we go fly? Well, let's go fly. Too All bad. right.